Hello and welcome back everybody to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. This is episode 141. Um, that's great. I, I, I'm very happy about this as we, you know, just a few more weeks will be at episode 150, but more importantly, for, well, at least for me, uh, when we, we slide up to 156, it'll be, we've been doing this for three years. And uh, as I was told a couple years ago, and I think it was Pat Flynn who told me this, that the average podcast goes only seven times. So uh, the fact that we've been able to keep this going this long, and of course, you know, Pat and I with our weekly meetings, uh, I'm very pleased. So uh, it's been a great week. Uh, the temperature today, uh, 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So that 20 to 22 Celsius range where, um, you know, it's just a, you know, it's, the weather is just nice. Uh, if, if, if you've, it's spring, uh, my beehive, the bees are working overtime. My dandelions are, you know, just, you know, just working extra. The dandelions are popping up everywhere. Um, but it's a good time of year. Uh, as I'm, as I'm speaking, uh, we are in the later part of track season. So my athletes are competing every weekend and, and doing well. And we had a, one of the best weekends I've ever coached in my life. All my athletes had personal records this weekend, which is just delightful. Before I begin, every so often I'll get a question on the podcast. How do I ask a question? And it drives me crazy because I tell you every week at about this time and at the end how to how to <laughs> how to ask a question. But of course, that would take people to actually look. So here it goes. If you want to ask a question, podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. Uh, I'm happy to answer any, and I think we're going to have a good one this week. We've got good questions. So we got a question from Hayden. Uh, how do you suppose one could maximize the stress put on the hand tendons so one could get maybe get the tendon strength similar to that of a, a peasant farmer, which is an interesting uh, uh, line. I've been doing farmer suitcase carries three to four times per week. Should I work up to the volume at lower intensity? like I would do with distance running training plan or does higher intensity and variations work better? Well, I, I, I don't, I, there's a very obvious reason. Uh, go find some place where they still have peasant farmers. And I would suggest, uh, you know, uh, waking up at sunrise and going to bed at sundown and, uh, working in the sun all day doing, um, those kinds of activities. And that's, and I, I'm not joking. Um, hand strength, is a, a very odd thing uh it really is it's the hand strength is so wired in neurologically to the brain that you have to be i mean it, it, you have to be i was going to say careful but it's it's one of the best monitors one of the best feedback uh options you have as a coach to figure out where your athletes are uh you can do it simply uh i mean i don't know how how well this would work but if you had a if you had an athlete who could hang 30 seconds, um, just just hang 30 seconds and out of nowhere doubles it, you can kind of assume that either the training you were doing that week or so before, maybe even a few days before, either you did something very smart that allowed this person to, you know, really light up everything neurologically, or it shows real progress. Uh, Hayden, I don't know. Um, there's much better grip people than I am. I always send people to uh, Bill Hinburn's site, uh, the super strength training site, because he's got all those books by like, I think they're like Jowlett and the Mighty Ant Adam and stuff, those books on grip strength. Uh, and when you get the books, they will be like the, a few pages of just very simple, fairly logical things. Uh, I remember the great wide receiver for the San Francisco 49ers and, and other clubs too, obviously, who uh, Jerry Rice, who once said that he thought the reason he had such good hands is because his father was a bricklayer and his dad would throw him bricks and he'd have to catch bricks. And if you don't catch a brick, it's got to, got to be bad somehow. And you, but you also have to have a strong, but soft catch. So the only thing I would say, Hayden is make sure that you also don't just get a mighty grip, but you know, make sure you, you can do something with the grip, you know, something specific. Um, uh, I like thick bar deadlifts. Personally, I like suitcase carries. I like hanging. Those are my big three for, uh, for grip strength. Uh, when you do the thick bar, do the Raptor or C grip, um, hanging, just hang. And then uh, suitcase carries and you're already doing them. So 
those would be the things I recommend and you're already already doing the big ones. So I hope that helps. It's a, a little different kind of question, but it's a good start for to, to a, our, our Q&A. Jorge asks us, do you have any ideas on what a conditioning version of easy strength would look like? Yeah, you just got to buy the book. Uh, I, uh, I'm a big believer in the work of Phil Maffetone, M-A-F-F-E-T-O-N-E. -E. Um, uh, okay. Uh, well, I cleaned up everything. And then, of course, whenever I clean up, I lose everything. But... Uh, I have all all of Phil's books. I think he's uh, he, his book on strength. I actually like a lot. His book on strength is very much like Easy Strength, but the idea, um, the Easy Strength conditioning would be, you take your age, and, and you you so you got the number one eighty, and you minus your age. Um, so I'm sixty five. So that would be holy cow. That number gets smaller every year. Um, that just shocks me to say that one. So 115, and then you take the number 160 and minus your age, which is 95. And he would want me to stay as long as I could in that 95 to 115 range. Uh, if you are on medicines, he asks you to go five lower. So uh, wow, 110 to, to 90, which is what I can do. But I can do that, I think, uh, 90 to 110. Maybe it was just like little, like one kilo or, you know, two pound weights in my hands. It's, it, you know, when I do heavy hand. So it's not very, it's not very hard. And of course, if you go up a hill at all, I go right up through higher. And then what you try to do is you try to have a very easy conditioning would be you would ramp yourself up to that nine, that 180, 180 minus your age number, but don't go over it and don't let it go under the 160 minus the age. And you do, okay, so you ramp it up to there. Take your time, take 10 to 15 minutes. Get into that heart rate and whatever it takes to do it. Uh, of course, the older you get, the easier this thing becomes, which is also makes sense because it's also healthy. It's safer, healthy, safe, healthy, you know. Stay on that as long as you can, you know, a half an hour, 45 minutes. And then... And then taper down at the end. Um, if you're if you're doing it with heavy hands or vests, uh, it's weird to pop the vest off and drop the weights and walk after you. When, when I very so I have a couple of different ways I do this. Sometimes I put on ankle weights and a and a vest. Uh, the vest weighs uh, 15 kilos, 33 pounds, and then I put the hand weights. And so that's when I do all three: ankle weights, vest, hand weights. <sighs> When I put those down, um, I, and when I take them off and then walk after, it is weird. It's like you, you, you're just kind of refreshed and ready to go. Uh, after doing that, for maybe I, I would really push it a little bit longer. Maybe I was going to say two months, but I would even say three months of that, just that keeping in there, then slide over for six to twelve weeks and add intensity to it. Uh, that would be whatever you consider interval training, um, uh, speed work. If you're competing, like, you know, if you're, I don't know, track and field, or if you just do like five K's in the weekends or whatever, or triathlons, and that would, those days would be considered hard days. And then you find one or two other days in the week where you try to really go in an interval of some kind. Now, most people get into intervals way too early and they pay a very high price on the other end. Uh, as they try to, uh, because, you know, interval training, yeah, it does raise your heart rate, heart rate, and yes, it probably increases body fat loss, but, you know, if you read a guy like uh, Clarence Bass, you know, Mr. Ripped, uh, and I'm rereading all of his work, here's his, um, these are his three Lean Advantage books, um, when you read him, you know, he's, his whole thing is, if you're losing more than a pound a week, uh, half a kilo a week, uh, very quickly you can get yourself, yeah, you'll keep losing weight, but you're you're losing muscle. So you're losing weight, but you're not losing a fat, which is probably what you want to do in, in most cases. I've said it a hundred times, thousand, million times. Two hardest things to do um, is to lose body fat. And then number two is increase lean body mass. And that's what people want to do. And some people want to do it at the same time. And I'm like, wow, you know, 
So that's how that's how I do it. Read the works of Maffey Tone. Uh, his site is outstanding. Uh, in the first book uh, with Pavel, we discuss it quite a bit in the book. Um, I won't. I don't know if I'll have it very much in the new book. Yeah, I'll talk about walking, but I'll, I'll sort of stay away from that stuff because it's not my uh, it's not my lane, bro. But uh, I'll do my best. Uh, maybe I'll think about it, Jorge, and I'll, I'll come back and maybe do some more in the book. We've got a question from Lawrence. Is it best to start off with high intensity first, then volume? The tradition is volume before intensity. And I think the tradition is right. There's more to ask. By that, I mean more reps, then increasing the weight when the reps become easy, especially for the squat. I mean more reps, then increasing the weight when the reps become easy, especially for the squat. So... I don't, I, I don't really understand that, Lawrence, in the real world. Um, you know, I've squatted 405, you know, uh, 182 kilos for 20. Um, it might have been 25. But um, with the squat, I think you dance. Uh, it's pretty easy to get the intensity up on the squat versus a lot of other exercises. Uh, and it's really easy to get the volume up on the squat versus a lot of other exercises. And therein lies the problem with high rep, heavy squats is that you can do that and that might shoot you. <laughs> that might shoot your recovery in the chest for, a <laughs> well, the, the joke is, you know, I did this workout in June, 1979. And as soon as I recover, I'm going to do it again. Well, you know, I think it's funny when I say that out loud, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, that's, those are hard to recover from. Um, I hope that helped. I, I didn't fully understand the question. Thank you. We have a question from Tim, and it's a it's kind of a funny one. I have an idea for a new throwing event along with a dumb but fun question. The throwing event is called, Can Dan John Throw You Farther Than You Can Throw a Discus? I'm 6'2 and about 95 kilos. So throwing a 95 kilo person, I got to tell you, is tough. Uh I've tackled 95 kilo people and put them on the ground and uh, just throwing them on the ground is hard to do. Um, and have great, and he also has great anaconda strength. That's which is good because that's what you want to have. So it'd be like throwing a 95 kilo water log. I have zero experience or skills in the throwing arts. So the discus won't go far for my part. Well, I can almost guarantee you're going to win because physics, uh, if I can pick up a 95 pound water log and move it, um, you know, there's, no, there's going to be no acceleration. There's going to be no speed. I, I think my angle of release isn't going to be very good. Uh, I don't think it would go. And you could just basically take the discus and go, ah, and it'll go farther. But it's a good sport. But the fun question from Tim. Also, when throwing a person, what's your preferred technique? Now, this is why this is funny. I actually know the technique that I want to use. I, I I do. I actually know the technique. And I'm kind of looking forward to my grandchildren being in the pool with me soon because I love doing this. I did it at their mom's. And uh, he asks, clean and jerk. And that's not a very good way to throw. Caber toss. Grab them by the ankles and take a few turns and let them fly or some other style. Now, I'd like to do that last one because they'd go the farthest, but, you know, it could also kill them. But what I used to do, uh, Tim, is I would take my daughters and have them stand straight up uh, and plank with their hands on their side like this. And then I would pick them up and then I would lean back and I would flip them like a clean grip snatch or a caber toss. And this is their feet and their heads would go backwards and they'd go whoosh, whoosh, boom in the water and we would be at like hotel pools I remember uh, down in Disneyland we did it at the Murray Park pool and it was weird because kids would say can you do that to me and I'd be like no <laughs> no if I hurt my own kids on a belly flop uh, then I'll deal with it I'm not hurting anybody else's kids but uh, yeah that's my preferred technique for throwing people I, I flip them by their feet However, it's in fact, it's an interesting thing. Now, segue this into, if you have a kid who can't be flipped caber style, uh, very often they're not knitted. So you have to be in a plank to make it work. 
And if the kid is spongy or, you know, not paying attention, you can't flip them. You throw them and it's, and as you hit, their, their hands go this way, their legs go this way, their body goes this way, and all that energy just gets... And it was an insight, an insight for me on coaching that I actually use with my throwers. And <laughs> so it's weird. And this is where the suitcase came from. The suitcase carry came from. Is to build up my throwers. Uh, uh, I call it the chain link fence. From the shoulders to the hips, I call it the chain link fence. Uh... The word fit comes from the old Nordic meaning to knit. And it's weird how chain link fence and to be knitted, they all tie together right there. So this part of, body, of the body should be like a chain link fence. Very strong, but very flexible. Very flexible, but very strong. And if you can't knit yourself in, when I go to caber toss you, blah, all the energy just gets wasted. I got to tell you, that was a fun question. Thanks, Tim. We got a question from David. That's my confirmation name. I was watching one of your YouTube videos on pull-ups. That's always a scary way to start a sentence. And you said you encountered people training for the fire department who had to train up to 25 pull-ups. Yeah, that's, that's, that's selection. And then they really never tested anymore. I can guarantee some of the firemen I see, I don't think they can pull themselves away from the kitchen table. Oh, snap. Uh, you recommended that they train up to 35 pull-ups so they have a cushion, right? I recently competed a Marine Corps PFT and did 19 pull-ups, which I was disappointed with. And David, we're all disappointed with you too. <laughs> I'm joking. That's fine. Hey, 19 is impressive. That said, it provides an opportunity for improvement. Do you recommend just proceeding along with the grease the groove method? Yes. To get 25 pull-ups, or would you recommend incorporating weighted pull-ups with the grease the groove method? as well in order to break through that 25 plus barrier. Well, David, it's going to be one of those classic it depends thing. Now, listen, the downside of doing pull-ups and weighted pull-ups is how hard they are on some people's elbows. I'm, I'm one of those. The upside of weighted pull-ups is that you're going to do much lower reps, which, and I would, if, if I were you, I would never fail on a rep any of this training. Pop down, shake it out, rest, pop back up. Don't don't fail in your pull-ups. Don't fail. And you, if you do, you'll pop your elbow, and everything I'm just saying is a waste of time. So Barry Ross and the easy strength methods uh, come together here where we would do this idea where uh, we're just going to spend... If, if the stronger I get, your max pull-up, max weighted pull-up, ideally, the more pull-ups you can do. Now, this is one of those things. On paper, this is right. If I'm getting you ready for a combine test, a great way to get your, if you have to bench press 100 kilos or 225 for reps, the guys who bench 700 pounds can get a lot of reps with 225 without even thinking about it. Um, I tested that thing when I first hit uh, heard about it and I, I think I would have won the NFL combine that season without ever one time ever doing high reps with the 225 bench. I'm not bragging I'm just saying that I, and I'm sure most of the guys most of the men listening right now who have a background in strength when you look at the NFL combine a lot of us go it's a waste of time because the, the, the well the test means nothing but who cares. Um I would suggest that you break it into maybe two week windows. So two weeks, you can do weighted pull-ups. And the goal in those two weeks of weighted pull-ups, and let's stay away from singles. Let's think triples. In the end of those two weeks uh, of triples, I want to see your, I want to see your weight. You're pushing your weighted triple pull-up max. After those two weeks, um, like maybe pick a number like 50 pull-ups. And when you go to train your pull-up, um, I mean, like one day do 10 sets of five, uh, another day do five sets of 10, another day do, I don't know, three sets of 15 or 16 or 17, wh wh whatever it works out. But just practice on those two weeks, getting pull-ups, but with that snappy boom, 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 five, I'm done. Yes, I could do more. I could do 10 or 15 more. 
I'm dropping. You're training like a track athlete. Okay. Uh, rest appropriate. Jump back up. Boom, 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 boom. Drop down. Rest. Boom, boom. Do that for two weeks. Come back to the weighted pull-up. And then I would like you to assess to see uh, when you do the weighted pull-up again. I mean, I guess we could maybe even change it. We're going to strive for a max double for the next two weeks. But then assess to see if that's working. That's six weeks. Uh, that should prefer provide you plenty of to do I would suggest now I know <clears throat> you Marines tend to do things every single day because that's how you do it but on the weighted pull-ups I would suggest maybe three days a week and if you have an ab wheel do that one day a week and just hang another day a week let's just stick with that let's just stick with that the whole time three days a week you're gonna pull up one day you're gonna have a serious ab wheel session ab wheel is pull-ups if you've done done correctly and just hang another session. Um, that's not bad. David, I hope that helps. Get back to me, okay? Thank you. We got Mike. And Mike is a 57-year-old detective. I guessed you might be a detective. I was about to do a whole Sherlock Holmes thing, but I'll stop right there. That has only got serious about lifting weights since 2019. My lifting has centered around the big lifts. After binge listening to your podcast content, I've become extremely interested in the Olympic lifts and I've dabbled in them before becoming very aware that I need some guidance on how to do them correctly before I injure myself. My question is, where should I look for a coach? What should I look for in a coach? My area has the workout that shall not be named instructors, but I'm not sure if that's the direction to go. I don't think so at all. I mean, I think they over that organization completely over coaches the uh, o lifts uh, i have videos online about how i coach it look at those i do however live approximately 30 miles from colorado springs colorado and i'm wondering if you have any suggestions or recommendation yeah i mean uh, well yeah i would try to go to one of the uh, united states weightlifting ones that has jim schmitz as the coach he's my coach and i, I thought he was great but there's a good chance that colorado springs probably has some people in the area um, I mean, I would do something as simple as maybe, I don't know how you ask around anymore, but I, mean, I was going to say put a newspaper ad in though. Uh, it doesn't happen anymore, but well, you're a detective. You figure this out. Find an Olympic lifter near you and just ask him. And I would pay them say, can I pay you 50 bucks to show me the basics of the snatch and clean and jerk? The first thing they'll do is pass out because they were offered to be paid. And the second thing they do, well, they'll teach you really well. That's my suggestion to you. Get somebody who's been there, done that, not somebody who's learning it with you know, crunches and all that lunacy, okay? Thanks. I hope it helps. Bye-bye. We have a question from Omar. I had an issue come up for me recently. I thought you might be able to help to give me some direction. Again, this one's a medical issue. I'm not going to give any medical advice. I'm a 36-year-old male, 190, and 20% body fat. I've been right-handed my whole life, but recently lost significant strength in my right arm, shoulder, pec, such that my left is significantly stronger than my right. Oh, yeah. Whereas I used to be able to do 10 to 15 push-ups and 5 pull-ups with good form, today I can no longer do a single pull-up or a push-up without shifting, twisting my weight onto my left arm. Stop doing those, because... Uh, you're going to get injury. This is going to cause you, I don't know, injuries in the spinal cord. It's going to cause you tissue injuries on one side, soft tissue injuries. Um, this, this, I would, I would hold off until things ease up. Um, when I'm pressing kettlebell strict while standing or a kettlebell press while lying on the floor, my right seems about 30 to 40, 35 to 40% weaker than my left. I was wondering what's the best way would be to even these two out. For example, should I do a routine that focuses on lots of isometric press volume? Any regards, uh, any insights would be great. Well, it comes down to this, man. Um, I've been there. And what you have to do with the injured side is just let it get back in shape. So there's a couple ways to go, and I'm not sure which one's the best. First, for, okay, it's an upper body injury, okay? So... You don't mention front squats. You don't mention uh, leg work. You don't mention hinge work at all. Uh, I would, if I could, if, if you can hold the front squat like this, 
I would start front squatting. That was always my answer when I was injured. If you can't, um, figure out something for the lower body and the hips. Hips, 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 thighs, thighs, thighs. Because every time you do those exercises, they're going to be pushing all those wonderful nutrients, not just to the, the quads, but to every inch of your body, and it's going to help you. Um, I hope you are seeing a physio or a, a physical therapist of some kind because um, there's some exercises I know that you could do that will be far better than the nonsense I'm going to tell you. What I would suggest is that you start training, um, you know, asymmetrically, unilaterally, you know, so try to keep and maintain your left side vigor as best you can. Again, if you're doing presses here, the good juju is going to go over to here. And then just be very gentle and take your time with the right side. Uh, I would not do too, too many things with two hands for a while. Now, if you have a suspension trainer or something like that, um, or, or there's some other things where you can, in a safe environment, do a row or something like that, two-handed, maybe. But mostly I would train upper body unilaterally. Um, one one side at a time. Uh, I would not push uh, the progress here. I would prod it, okay? Don't go, oh, I'm going to get my arm back in shape. I would just go, okay, a little bit, 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 a little bit. And if you give yourself time, if you prod it along, uh, re recovery will be uh, pretty good. If you push it, you're going to have these massive regressions either to re-injuring yourself or whatever cause you, you didn't you didn't want specific or uh, backtracking a little bit and then you're gonna get in that weird loop of dun 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 dun, dun, dun and that's not a place you want to be hope that helps we have a question from tim i have a question about scapular winging have you come across this phenomenon in your time as a strength coach i've heard the term is it a real issue or just one of those made up by physios and chiropractors to make some money? So, okay, let me let me go through the whole thing and I'll, and I'll respond. My scapula does not flush to the rib cage in a lot of positions, nor does anybody's really. Um, this is one of those weird days where I'm not getting that <laughs> noise as I go up and down here. Because the other day, uh, James Parker, uh, who's a one of the athletes I worked with when we were both younger. Uh, he's also on our American 2004 Olympic team as a hammer thrower. He's now a chiropractor. He uh, kind of put, he kind of put one of my, uh, it sounds weird, but as a thrower, I've always had this little problem and he, he put some pressure on it. It was like, a and now I can go like this again. So is it an imaginary term? I don't, I, I don't have the skill set to say yes or no. I've seen it with myself. I know people work on it, but I have another point. I can feel it slide around the rib cage instead of being locked down. Would you recommend any exercises that can improve, improve scapular control and the strength of the muscles that you integrate? Yeah, I have three. But the, the point I'd like them to make is that if you're walking down the street and you saw a human uh, scapula, by itself i'm not sure your brain would say human bone right away it uh, you know most of our bones you know are these long bones or you know are you know, you know cranium you, you recognize them the scapula is a just a strange looking thing uh it is a bizarre thing with all these points of contact around it because it's a very when we traded uh, uh four-legged locomotion for two, uh, it had to adapt to do some other jobs. So do I have some scapular things? Yeah, and oh, it's funny because, you know, I'm, as a thrower, I have shoulder issues. But what's interesting is that the same shoulder issues fixes that I do might help you. The first, and of course, no surprise here, is just simply hanging, okay, hanging. Now, there is this little hanging shrug you can do like that. And it's funny because I'll get these great neck and I don't know what else. Let's just say it is the ribs pop. God, I don't know what it is. 
but I'll go, I'll do a few of these hangs and all these little short little tugs like this. And uh, I'll get off and I'll be like, oh, we call, I call it poor man's chiropractor, you know. Oh. The next exercise comes from Dick Notmeyer. We used to do this at the end of every uh, jerk. Is they're called press outs. You jerk the weight overhead and then you just go like this. Now, if done correctly, uh, it really trains the serratus muscles. You know, those those sh those finger muscles on the sides of your front of your rib cage. And you'll notice it. it, it I had a bodybuilder once point out that I had a, had great serratus muscles and he knew that I was an Olympic lifter because of it. And I was like, Linka, that's not something you expect to hear, uh, but, but it was true. And the final thing is something McCoy recommended in his book, 1958, but I still think it has value. When you, when you bench press at the top of the bench press, you do, the, he called them, <laughs> that was my shoulder, fuck me. Uh, so, hey, magic. So at the top, you would do these, he called them the shoulder shrugs. So those three, so the shrugging on the pull-up bar, the shrugging on the press, and the horizontal shrug might help you. Uh, I am certainly no PT or physio, but they've helped, these things have helped me and my thrower kind, okay? All right, hope that helped. Thank you. We have a question from Orist. I'm an older guy, age 68, good health, still employed full-time as a lawyer. Good. Ben, so we have had a detective and a lawyer this week, so let them sort it out. Been working out on and off most of my life. I recently finished the Strong Lifts 5x5 program. I don't know what it is. And I'm currently doing two lift program based on your podcast with Pat Flynn of back squats and presses. Isn't that funny? Because I would, if it's a Dan John program, the word back squat probably doesn't go together, but I get it. Three times a week, about nine sets of increasing weights of five reps down to doubles or a single. These programs lean towards building strength. I keep reading that to avoid uh, sarcopenia, one needs to build muscle. I'm not sure what that means. Um, yes, Your Honor, I don't know what it means either sometimes. Uh, most people get those ages of, of elderly life, those issues of elderly life uh, from not doing anything. It's, you know, it's wasting by not doing things. So I, when I, when I read and I, you know, I subscribe to AARP or I got this week's magazines, right? Somewhere back there. And, uh, you know, I read there, I read online about stuff and I think you get a real mix of advice from, um, from, uh, those, the, some of the, the information given to the elderly because the bulk, the bulk, hey, first off. Bulk of the people don't work out. Probably one in 20 Americans train, work out at any level. At all. And I'm afraid to say that might number <laughs> might be too high. So when we hit our, when we hit, basically, I think it's about 35. There's this gradual decline in all qualities. Now, the fact that you've been lifting means that as you've been declining since 55, uh, 35, you're still above the norm, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna slide back into your question, but you're 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 well ahead of the curve right now. Just said that these programs lean towards building strength. I keep reading of okay, I'm not sure what that means. Neither right. Should I forego these strength building programs and do some more like bodybuilding and multiple exercises per day, three to six three to six sets? That's way too much. Three sets are fine of eight to 12 reps. Just looking for some guidance and direction. Maybe with your guidance, you can recommend one of your own programs that I could purchase. Holy cow. Boris, I can't believe you don't know this. DanJohnUniversity.com. Go to the workout generator and three days a week, I want you to do um, whatever it pings you up to do. Uh, just do the basics. Put in the equipment you have. Three days a week. Three days a week, I would like it. It's funny. You'll be doing three sets of 12, three sets of 10, three sets of eight. You'll be doing basic bodybuilding movements. You'll be doing, you know, and nothing too complicated, pretty simple. But the nice thing is if you do that push-pull hinge squat loaded carry with mobility work and you still have the energy to do your uh, squat and press program, um, I, I, let's do this. Let's do it this way. Let's have you do 
three to six weeks of the workout generator on Dan John University. And then after that, do like a two week reboot on the Pat Flynn program. Uh, program. And uh, let's talk. I like that. Oris, so there you go. Uh, if you want a discount, uh, type in uh, here a lawyer. You should be fine. Enjoy. Join the site and uh, uh, go right to the workout generator. Spend some time on the forum and ask people other ideas because there's a lot of us in our 60s on the forum. Uh, read some of the, there's a ton of PDFs and uh, articles and books. Uh, we have stuff from, oh gosh, we have probably five or six different authors in our PDFs and uh, enjoy the voyage and let's uh, let's continue to lift and talk <laughs> for a long time. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. Well, that, wow, that is it for today. I, I'm i impressed. A very short podcast. Um, again, if you have questions, email them to me at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com, the same place I just sent Orist. And uh, uh, by the way, I, I think you should go there as much as you can. Um, we're, we're, we're constantly adding new things, new materials. I'm constantly learning new stuff, and I want to share it with you. Well, like I say, I'm Dan John from danjohnuniversity.com. Until next time, let's all keep on lifting and learning. Thanks, folks. Bye-bye.